Other than that, we wanted to welcome you this morning to the second in the uh, five series workshop uh, from the Alliance, which is focusing on building health research infrastructure in Orange County. And today's focus on, is on cultural competency, awareness, and sensitivity. And Marianne Fu from the uh, Orange County Asian Pacific Islander uh, Community Alliance will be your presenter today. I just wanted to highlight the Delhi Community Center, which is the space that we're in. Just a little bit of information about many of you know who Delhi is. Um, and this beautiful facility actually has been here, this, this space has been here since 1969, which is new to me. And the space that we're actually in has been here since 2001. It seemed like just yesterday. So it's, it's hard to believe it's been so long. They continue to be a great resource in the community. This is their vision, mission, and values. And they have lots of great programs, including dance classes, which is the space that you're in. Um, they have health, uh, humanities, um, socioeconomic courses and whatnot, as well as, as you saw as you walked in, English as a uh, second language course. So they're a great community resource, and we just wanted to acknowledge them and recognize the space that we're in today. And as I mentioned, this is a series of workshops that started uh, about a month ago, and there are five workshops. Many of you will be participating in all of them. Uh, this is the second in the series, and it really is um, a part of this larger project, which is the Orange County Alliance for Community Health Research, or CACHR. And the goal is really to build and encourage community-based participatory research projects addressing health issues in Orange County. So through these series of workshops, as well as just skills building in terms of the informational topics, we're hoping that you will network and build new partnerships to develop relationships in which we can address the health care issues here in Orange County. Just a little bit of background on the Alliance. These are our community partners. Uh, UCI's Institute for Clinical Translational Science, Cal State Fullerton, the Children and Families Commission of Orange County, the Healthcare Agency, OCAPICA, and Public Health Foundation Enterprises. And this project is based out of the ICTS, which is one of 60 across the country. And there's only uh, programs in 30 of the 50 states. So there's still a lot of work to be done looking at the very uh, big disparities that exist in some of these other states. And the goal of the project is really to get bench to bedside a lot quicker, but also a lot better. So really to be culturally competent and to really translate information to our communities where we can make the biggest impact. So that's really the purpose and goal of, of the alliance. I wanted to highlight a funding opportunity from the Institute for Clinical and Translational Sciences if you haven't received the email. It's a part of your slide packet. We have uh, a program called the Incubator Awards, which are kind of, <coughs> if you will, seed grants to build CBPR partnerships. So the first series of grants is actually due May 1st, which is not too far away, but the grants are not so tedious, and you can find information on the grant opportunity at the links provided here, and Dr. Montoya, Michael Montoya at UCI will be your point of contact if you have any questions. And we are also here as a resource, the Alliance, to help you build um, these grant applications if you're interested, especially as participants of the workshop. So please contact me if you're interested in more information regarding that. So we're going to start off this morning now that you're nice and settled with a little icebreaker. And I'm going to pass around these baskets. And if you could just pick a piece of paper out and don't open it yet, we're going to start the morning with some introductions and we're going to make some new friends. I'll just go ahead and pass that around. Mm -hmm. So uh, grab a piece of paper, don't open it yet. You're going to get up and go and approach someone you do not know. And you're going to do introductions first with your name mm -hmm. and then do whatever the instructions are are made to speak. Really, you'll get it. And then after that, you're going to be, go ahead and find two other people to introduce yourselves to, and then come back to your seat. Yeah. So, come on. So go ahead and grab a piece of paper, get up, meet some new people. <laughs> yeah, I did that. I just want to thank everybody because the buzz was awesome. So, you guys, I'm sure, met more than two new people, which was fabulous. And I want to thank you for having the courage of just jumping in and doing it. I got I know about the open piece of papers and looks like what is she thinking? <laughs> uh, so I appreciate that trust and just stepping forward and, and, and trying to go through the uh, activity. So what did folks feel? Maybe folks can share because folks had different readings, if you will. It's very strange to try to kiss people as you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. Any other thoughts, Chris? Well, I had the big warm hug, so oh, being a big hugger myself, it was really easy. And everything was happy to hug, so I think it's good. Awesome. For me, it was the opposite. I'm not a hugger, but I had the hugging one, so like, kind of like, okay. <laughs> Well, did anybody have um, a rubbing noses one? Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
So the first one, and it can come from other countries, but I wanted to reference this particular activity and study, uh, comes from the Netherlands or Belgium. Greeting people by embracing and kissing them twice is Portugal or Spain. France. Parisians actually kiss and alternate four times. I think these could be multiple yeah. countries, but these are just some of the examples I wanted to share with you all um, and to acknowledge this exercise from this particular uh, project. Um, greeting others by placing your hands in prayer, bowing forwards, Japanese. The rubbing noses is Inuit. Very good. A lot of people caught that. Um, greeting someone with a big warm hug comes from Russia. The Palestine, okay. right, as well as other places in the world, right. Gripping with a very firm handshake is from Germany, and then keeping a distance of about two feet and gripping with a light grip is from England. So I love the Oz and Oz because some of those are norms, and folks are like, yeah, Parisians, French, you know, and some of them are not. And we also don't want to generalize the stereotype and assume that every German in the world is going to sh shake your hand with a firm handshake, right? But these are some ways to help us overgeneralize a little bit and understand communities. However, we don't want to make assumptions that every German who walks in is going to shake your hand with a firm handshake, right? And that's just one nuance of who culture, what culture and community really is. There's language. I thought about starting the day with different welcomes in different languages. Right? There's the, the country that you come from. And culture is so much richer than just your racial and ethnic differences. Right? And so today, we're going to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about that. And Marianne's also going to share some of that experience, as well as the culture within academic organizations and community-based organizations, which is a part of this partnership and the relationship. 
relationships we're trying to foster. So thank you again, everyone, for participating. That was fabulous. So today's training objectives are to increase awareness and understanding of culturally competent, community-based participatory research methodology, to identify local resources to ensure CBPR projects are culturally competent, to understand CBPR, uh, how CBPR leads to cultural competence, and really to inspire compassion and understanding. And within your packets today are the slides, so feel free to follow that, and then you'll also have them up front here today. As I mentioned, um, our great presenter today is Marianne Fu. She happens to be my boss. She's the <laughs> executive director of the Orange County Asian Pacific Islander Community Alliance. If you haven't had the opportunity to meet her, I think you will really enjoy, um, especially today's discussion with her. She will bring a fresh light to the notion of cultural competency, um, and you'll find her other skill sets along the way. <coughs> uh, Marianne is the executive director and founder of Ocapica, a nonprofit based uh, organization serving APIs and other communities in Southern California regarding health, mental health, policy, youth leadership and development, community and economic development, and education needs. Ocapica has almost 40 staff that speak 16 languages with programs that serve more than 80,000 community members a year. Marianne has been working for more than 20 years on health issues on national, state, and local levels at several different community and countywide organizations. She also helps to lead several community-based participatory research projects including Ocapica's National Center of Excellence to Eliminate Health Disparities, focused on Pacific Islanders and Southeast Asians in the United States, a California Breast Cancer Research Project focused on patient navigation for Southeast Asians, and a National Cancer Institute-funded Pacific Islander Cancer Project. Marianne received her Bachelor's of Science in Psychology from the University of California, Davis, and her Master's in Public Health from UCLA, and is a fourth-generation Chinese-Japanese Californian who is married to a Japanese-Peruvian and they have two beautiful young sons. And you'll love this. When she's not exhausted, she enjoys going fishing with her family or playing natural maker for her coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> One of the skill sets that you might or might not be thrilled to learn about today. And she has the best of intentions with her <coughs> skills. So please help me welcome Marianne. Thank you. Actually, that's how I met my husband, so I'm going to use that for a matchmaking session. <laughs> my husband is a Japanese Peruvian, and when I first met him, he kissed me, so I'm like, ooh, he likes me. <laughs> and he didn't, but he <laughs> it was his greeting, so I'm like, oh, I thought he was really into me. And well, we got married, so eventually he became into me. <laughs> it was really hard for me at first because I'm Japanese and Chinese, and you know, my parents were not big huggers. Until once I had children, now they, they hug and kiss them all the time. But, you know, I, they weren't really big huggers because that wasn't our culture. And then when I met my um, husband's family and friends, there's like 60 Peruvians attacking me. <laughs> and then they never went home. Because <laughs> at 1 a.m., all the tables start moving and they start, it's a dance floor. So I had to get used to a whole different culture and... and just so many people kissing me all the time, but it, it's wonderful because you embrace it and then you really enjoy it. Say, I love this. Um, so I love that activity. I really am going to have like a gathering of singles. And, and <laughs> 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 I think that's so great. Thank you, Jackie, for that. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about, I know you had another speaker because all of our, my coworkers are like, oh, God, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I'm like, surprise. Um, but um, the two other speakers could not make it, and so I'm hoping to just provide you with a little bit of information because when I look in this room, oh my gosh, you, all the folks I know here, you are experts in cultural competence, so I'm sure we're going to learn from each other today as well. But I'm really going to talk about cultural competency and community-based participatory research because that's been my experience. So these are just great pictures of the communities and the community leaders that I have the pleasure of working with. So my background is uh, I'm somewhat culturally competent with some Asians and Pacific Islanders, some Peruvian and Mexican American, some LGBTQ community, some youth, some adults, some older adults, farmers, I'm, I'm from a rural area, I know farming really well, so I'm really good with farmers, rural populations, some, some animals, some Catholics, Muslims, Christians, and some others. So I'm, I'm not culturally competent, so I'm not this big expert, and I didn't want you to think I was some big expert, I just know a little bit of something. 
but I'm really willing to learn. And that's the whole thing about being culturally competent, is that willingness to learn. And I make mistakes all the time, and I don't have the answers. Um, cultural competency for me has been a lifelong learning experience, which I really enjoy, just learning about other communities, other cultures, other experiences. I learned a lot about youth culture from my coworkers. Um, they taught me about Facebook, and now I Facebook them all, and they were very sorry I do that, because I find out what they do on the weekend, and talk to them about it. Um, I offend many, but I'm always apologetic, so I'm so sorry. I tend to joke a lot, and so a lot of times my coworkers will be, that's not very culturally appropriate, <laughs> or, you know, so I, I'm sorry if I, I offend. Um, I may not always understand something, but it's important. But if something's important culturally, um, I always stay open and accepting and just try and make it work for everyone in the situation. And that's something big is that whole negotiation and learning about others. Um, I'm the executive director of an Asian and Pacific Islander organization, and I've never taken an Asian American studies class. So um, it, that's what's so funny to me is people see me as an expert for Asians and Pacific Islanders, and I'm like, I've never even taken an Asian American studies class. I don't know anything. Um, but I'm learning from all my all the coworkers, partners, people I get to work with. So you don't have to become an expert. You just have to have a willingness to learn. And just because somebody is that ethnicity or from that culture doesn't mean they know either. I, I really thought for most of my life I was Marsha Brady from the Brady Bunch. So I showed who I am. So um, I just want to start off with voices from the community. And this is from um, an experience uh, that we've worked with researchers on. And this was way back, this is a while ago, and this was when community-based participatory research started becoming popular. So this is the viewpoint from the university researcher. Um, and the university researcher, we were at a community meeting, and we had community members who were researchers too, who were conducting the surveys with this researcher. So the researcher says, looking at the surveys, hey, all the writing looks the same. Um, they aren't valid because you filled them out for the participants. And the community researcher said, are you saying I'm being dishonest? University research. I'm not saying, I, I'm just saying I can't use any of these surveys because you filled them out and not the participants. And the community researchers say, but the participants are elderly. In my culture, as someone who's considered young, if I don't fill them out for them, it's considered highly disrespectful and rude, and I'm not helping them as I should. That's my role. The university researcher said, but we want the participants to fill out the surveys because if you do it, you're biasing them. It's basic research methodology. And everyone at the table is like, ah! Oh! You know? So the community researchers say, so you're saying I'm stupid and dishonest, and I don't know how to do research in my community? And the university researcher, no, I'm saying you're doing it wrong. And then the other people at the end of the table, the other community members are like, she's saying that we don't know our communities. She's saying we're lying and dishonest. We're not working with her. So it was an explosion of what happened. Um, and it was about 20 community members around the table all glaring at this researcher who just saying, you cannot fill out the surveys for them. And it happened to be the person who was the community researcher who's told and goes, I'm going to fill those sur surveys out because that's really rude. And if I don't, it, this is not going to happen. We're not going to work with you. So you can just see a basic misunderstanding or just a way that this researcher was used to, no, you're going to give a survey out, they're going to fill it out. That's it, nothing. They weren't negotiating. Here's another one that we've had experience, university researchers. I need you to have 300 surveys done by next month, and I've only received about 20. You're supposed to be working full time on this, what are you doing? It should be only 30 minutes to administer the survey. <coughs> How many of you have heard that? <laughs> I know, I'm still, I hear it all the time. I'm like, oh my god, give me a break. <laughs> the community researcher was, the questions you're asking are very personal. Income level, sexual history, personal trauma. I can't ask those in 30 minutes. Some of these things are never discussed in my culture. Be, plus, because I'm from the community, if I don't spend the first hour talking about who I am, where I came from, who my family is, you know, they're not going to even be open to me. Um, I, ha I then have to spend another hour helping them with other things like reading bills or doing paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> you know, then I can ask the survey questions. And because they don't speak English, it takes me twice as long to administer all the questions in another language. Then I have to eat with them because if I just leave, <laughs> it's like I use them. It takes me about three to four hours to do a survey. And everybody's like laughing because I think you identify with this. 
Um, and the university researcher said, you can't do that. You should go in, just do the survey. You know, you shouldn't be in there all day eating with them. You're not using your time efficiently or effectively. And that, another relationship broke down because for the community, they're like, you just don't understand. I, I live in this community every single day. If I just walk in here, I'm going to ask you all these questions. How many times do you have sex? Using condoms? This is it. I'll be kicked out. I have to live here, so don't do that to me. Um, and then finally, some other voices from uh, just some voices from researchers that um, have questioned us. Um, we're doing this great research project on your community, and we want you to be a part of it. You know, it's great. Um, but can you just translate the survey and disseminate it to the community? And sorry, we don't have funding for the project, um, but don't you want to help your community? You know, we get that a lot too, where it's like, you know, I thought you wanted to help your community. So this guilt, and for um, an Asian Catholic, it really works. It's like, <laughs> you know, don't you just want to help this, these people? And then later you find out, but you have three million dollars. Yeah, I want to help my community. You should be helping too. Um, another university researcher. And this is, we, we love, 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 love university researchers. These are just some of the poor experiences we've had. We've had some amazing, amazing experiences. I actually should have put them up. Um, here's another case. We analyzed the data and found that the parents in your communities, they don't want to get involved in, your, in their children's school. So in this case, they didn't have the community members involved in the analysis. So they just looked at the data, which said, um, no, I'm not involved in the schools. <laughs> what they didn't do, if they would have had community members involved in the analysis, they would have found out that these parents are working two to three jobs, mm -hmm. that they don't have time, that they feel intimidated to go to the school because their, their English is a second language. <laughs> when there was more analysis done, it was found, they found out that the parents were just heartbroken. They could not be involved in their children's school, but they wanted to be. Um, so, in this case, by not having the families involved, or by not having the community involved in the analysis, it really looks poor. It looks like very negative. Oh, you know, this, this, these families don't want to have anything to do with their child's education. So, you're not going to get a good analysis. Um, and then the next one. We want to do phone, in, phone interviews in language with older adults. We'll just recruit our students to do them. One of my students have already translated the interview tool. Now, we hear that a lot. Okay, young people, on average, um, especially if they've been in the country for a long time, their language skills are just, it's, it's, they're not the same. Um, and to translate an interview tool, it's, it's really difficult. Um, and we see that a lot. You know, or also you'll have young students calling older adults, and they'll be like, who's this little kid calling me? Um, and so you want to make sure you're matching up and you're talking to the community. In some cases, that might be really good. People, we did a voting, we did uh, uh, phone banking, and the older adults really like to hear young people call them because they felt like, oh, you're really interested in the community and you want to help out the community. But when we talk about breast cancer or cervical cancer, they don't want to hear from someone younger than them. So it really depends on the issue. Okay. So what is cultural competence? Um, and what is it all about? And you're going to hear cultural competence, cultural competency, culturally competent, culturally sensitive, culturally appropriate. You're going to hear all of these terminology uh, inter, uh, kind of intertwine or, or used um, together. Um, so I looked up on the online, Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online, and I love that dictionary because it has the regular dictionary, which I never understand. Then it has an English language learner dictionary, which I really do understand better. Um, and that one was better. And then it has a children's dictionary, which is even better. So I use the children's dictionary. <laughs> because when I read it, I'm like, I have no idea what they're trying to say and what kind of example it is. So some of these will get easier. So culture is the customary beliefs, social forms, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group. So that's one way to look at culture. It might be racial, it might be religious, it might be social. Um, it's also the set of shared attitudes values, goals, and practices that characterizes an institution or an organization. So it can be institutional, it could be the corporate culture, you know, um, <coughs> scouts, you know, it, it could be anything. Um, or organization, it could be a nonprofit organization, it could be a university, it could be anything. Culture is also the set of values, conventions, or social practices associated with a particular field, activity, or societal characteristic. You can, you can tell I took that from regular dictionary, because <laughs> um, usually I, I won't understand everything. 
Um, <laughs> culture is a way of thinking, behaving, or working that exists in a place or organization, such as a business. Um, so again, it's, it's just you know a set of thinking, believing, or practices. Competence or competency or competent is being adequate. Not being an expert, it's being adequate. It's having a better understanding, it's having a skill, it's doing something well, and having the necessary abilities or qualities. So you're not an expert, but you, you have a better understanding, and you have some abilities, and you have qualities. So I took this definition of cultural competency, cultural competence, from the National Association of Social Workers. I really, I really liked it. Um, cultural competence refers to the process by which individuals and systems respond respectfully and effectively to people of all cultures, languages, classes, races, ethnic backgrounds, religions, and other diversity factors in a manner that recognizes, affirms, and values, and that's the big thing, values, the worth of individuals, families, and communities, and protects and preserves the dignity of each. And I think that was such a nice um, definition because when I work with the community, what I always hear is, I just want them to respect me. I don't want them to call me a boat person. I don't want them to call me, oh, it's that poor person on Medi-Cal, or oh, she collects food stamps. They want to be valued, and they don't want to have that perceived discrimination, um, and they want to feel that, you know, that their culture has a lot of strength. So I love that definition. And there's just tons and tons of, of information on cultural competency online as well. But the National Association of Social Workers, I thought, had a really nice definition. So, why are they culturally competent? I think it's pretty obvious. You know, you want to improve your understanding. You want to do your job more effectively. You want to improve communication. You want to improve trust. You want to have improved relationships. You can work with diverse populations. You can improve self-awareness. And you have reduction of barriers and disparities. And I think those are key. Um, I had, uh, I used to work for a great organization called Families in Good Health in Long Beach. And we worked at a hospital. And um, there's two different cases where uh, one doctor was culturally competent and the other felt like, I don't need to do this. So we had a Lao family, and um, the woman needed to have a C-section. And the first doctor who's working with this family said, because um, the woman said, I don't want to have a C-section. And her husband's like, no, you're not having a C-section. And so the patient navigator was telling the doctor, can you just talk to the family? Can you talk to the family about why she needs the C-section? Because she thinks you just want to cut her up and, and experiment and learn you know, from her body. They don't want to do that. They're really worried about the health of the baby. They want to have the best possible labor. Um, and they want to bring their child in you know, healthy. And he goes, you know what? I don't care. I don't have time. They need to follow the rules. If not, leave this hospital. And so he was just like, you know, I was respectful. I don't want to work. You know, if you're not going to follow what I'm saying, then go somewhere else. So they went somewhere else, and they didn't have to have a C-section. So she had a normal pregnancy, and, and she had normal delivery. So then the family went and told everyone, don't go to that place because they just cut you up, and they don't listen to you. And so the organization had to do a lot of damage control. And so another case came up very similar. Another Lao family, <coughs> same thing. The do and a different doctor was saying, I really think um, you know, she needs to have a C-section, and these are the reasons why. So the woman, um, this woman said, you know, I really don't want to have a C-section. And the husband, same thing, I don't want my wife to have a C-section, I'm worried about her. And so the patient navigator said, please, 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 you know, to the doctor, please just sit down with the entire family and talk about why. And this doctor was much more open and said, okay, you know, um, how many people are going to come in? Let's just create a space and they can come in, let's make an appointment. So 14 people came in, <laughs> auntie, uncle, parents, um, you know, everybody came in because they wanted to be a part of the decision making. He took two hours and he explained why she needed the C-section, why she was at higher risk, why they were concerned for her, um, and she had had bleeding and things like that, and that they weren't there to do anything bad, but they were worried about the health of the baby. Once he explained, he talked to everybody, and the patient navigator prepared him when the grandparents come in, greet them first, you know. And so she, she really helped, you know, do this, do that, um, not giving him a recipe, but just, you know, who you want to acknowledge first, and you want to listen to everybody. 
Because of that experience, the family left extremely happy, very confident in the hospital, very confident in the doctor. And they went around talking to the community. I want to go here, and I like that doctor. He's the best. He really took care of us. So she had a really good experience. You can see when someone's very open to understanding why and taking the time so someone can make an informed decision, it really, really works. So that's why we're culturally competent, to be more open and to be better at what we do. So culture can be anything. It can be, my favorite culture is pop culture. I love reading People Magazine every single day, learning about my friends, Angelina and Brett. <laughs> they are, they are my personal friends. I love those kids. So, um, and then I, I love Facebook. So I love the whole social media culture. I don't have Twitter or anything like that, but I, I like to follow people on Facebook. Food can be culture. Think about your favorite foods and where they come from. What it means. Like when I have southern cooking, I just feel at home. I feel so good. Or when I have a bowl of ramen, I just I feel so good. That feeling you get from your favorite foods that come from your culture, from different cultures. Um, religion also has so much cultural meaning and context. Um, I put farming because rural areas, you know, is a culture in itself. Um, these are skateboarders, the skateboarder culture. Uh, this is Girl Scouts, and, and all, I love this picture because all the girls are Muslim, and I thought that was not all American. You have Girl Scouts, and you, and you have all the, you know, these girls are so cute. Um, and representing, you see that Girl Scouts have Vietnamese Girl Scouts, they have, you know, Chinese Girl Scouts. So it's really, it's, it's, um, it's, it's just exciting to see that in the United States. And you have street culture, you have urban culture. So culture can be anything. It doesn't have to be about race or ethnicity. Uh, it can be about anything. And is it difficult to be culturally competent? People used to say, when I worked with healthcare providers, um, mo probably 99% were like, I want to learn more about my uh, patients. I want to learn more about their background. But I'd always have a few that are, I don't need to be culturally competent. I'm just respectful. That's all I need to be. My <coughs> job is to be a doctor and to respect them and provide them care. Why do I have to need anything more? Why do I have to worry about them? They just need to follow this. Um, and they used to tell me it's really hard to learn about every single patient's background. But if cultural competency is so hard, why is it that tobacco and alcohol companies can do it? Um, here's Pachanga Resorts. They're the most culturally competent group I know. Um, Pachanga Resort and Casino, a luxury bus. They have it in Chinese. They have it in Vietnamese. They go to Asian Garden Mall and park and wait for all the elderly Vietnamese to come. You get money. You get tickets. You get food. You know, you have movies. You know, you have Paris by Night showing. And um, you have, they also have all the, you know, famous people coming in for uh, Koreans and Vietnamese and Chinese playing, you know, music at the resort. So they're so good at marketing, at being aware. Uh, Bicycle Club, <coughs> another gambling place in the South Bay, they serve fried fish at the tables, you know, and just very, very culturally complicated. Um, there's also, look at this one is for uh, alcohol companies supporting GLAD, filtering out inequality. So knowing the messages, knowing how to market, how to reach the community. And then also I have ER up here because I like, I used to love this show um, in the first days. Um, I think there was a, uh, one time when Nurse Hathaway said, she was talking about language access um, and there was a Latino couple and the wife was really sick and she was going into renal failure and the husband didn't know and they were trying to figure out the entire show what happened to her and what they finally found was Nurse Hathaway said, is she on any medication? Give it to me. And she read it and it says, it says once, take once a day. Once in, in Spanish is, what's once in Spanish? Eleven. eleven. She took eleven pills. Oh. Um, so I was like, oh, you are so great. Because <laughs> Nurse was like, we need to be able to under, you know, people need to be able to read the other labels. We should put it in language. Um, the other thing we are did too, and it was again Nurse Hathaway, she always had the best lines. She would say, at uh, one time, uh, there was a uh, Vietnamese woman that came in, or Asian woman that came in, and she was saying, we need to do a pap smear because Vietnamese women have the highest incidence rate of cervical cancer. And I was like, well! Wow! <laughs> so, so programs can be very culturally competent. <laughs> so, I love that. I, I wrote to them saying, thank you so much. <laughs> um, now, roles. 
If Lowe's can be culturally competent, if they can, I mean, when I first, when Lowe's opened up, I ran, you know, I was there because I want to say, I'm a Home Depot kind of gal. And then, but I walked into Lowe's, and what I found was, the first sign I saw, this is on their website, word for word. Welcome, Lowe's speaks your language. You know, how many hospitals have something like this? <laughs> Lowe's speaks your language, so I just want to read it. We're making shopping for home improvement supplies easier for our international customers. Language line phone service, available in most stores, provides professional quality live translation, translation of more than 140 languages. Whether customers speak Spanish or Hindi, Hmong or Mandarin, I was like, oh, they even know what Hmong is! You know? <laughs> <laughs> A translator can assist them in speaking to store employees. And a card on display in the stores offers a short explanation of the service in 20 common languages. And when you walk into Lowe's, I, I didn't see it in my Lowe's lately, but when I first walked in, there's a big sign. We speak your language, and there's like 40 languages there. And I was so excited. And then they, their name tags, hi, I speak Vietnamese, I speak Korean, I speak Spanish. And I was going up to every person like, oh, you speak Spanish. <laughs> oh, you speak Mandarin. I'm so proud. I'm so proud of Lowe's. Um, and, so, and they have, um, in addition to the language line, some Lowe's stores have Spanish-speaking employees on staff. And a sign on the door tells the customers to look for associates wearing I speak Spanish buttons. The language of home and family is universal. Now the language of home improvement is too. So, Lowe's, which sells hardware, it sells light bulbs and it sells wood, you know, lumber. If they can do it, why don't we have this in every setting, you know? And so, I, I'm just really curious on cultural competency, language competency, language, you know, how do we get this everywhere? So, um, this is another slide, the iceberg concept of culture. So, culture is not simple. There's so many nuances to it. And so when people think about culture, they think of the tip of the iceberg. Food, dress, music, visual arts, drama, crafts, dance, literature, language, celebration, and games. Um, but there's so much more to it. There's, here's some unspoken rules. You go deeper into the culture. You go underneath the surface. You start to see courtesy, um, contextual conversations and patterns, concept of time, personal space. It's hilarious, my husband is, um, ethnically Japanese, but born and raised in Peru. And so you can see his whole changes. So it, he has Japanese friends, and we go to Japanese friends at 4 o'clock, because everything starts oh. early for Japanese. And then you see him, you know, bowing and, and, you know, being more serious, and, you know, they're downing their drink. This is, I'm sorry, I'm generalizing. These are stereotypes. <laughs> Not all Japanese people do this. But he's, he's really uh, very culturally different. He's showing respect. He's pouring. Um, and then later on, like at 9 o'clock, we go have dinner at <laughs> 9 p.m. with his Peruvian friends, and he, his whole demeanor changes. He's loud, he's, a, you know, he's out there dancing, and, you know, um, he's just talking, um, and he's very effusive, and, and he's talking really fast. In Japanese, he talks really slow. Um, and you can just see there's so many hidden things that I didn't understand, and I just watch him, you know, in just out of curiosity, because it's so amazing how he can just change his worlds. Um, personal space, um, you'll see him bowing, you know, and that's, he's bowing to his Japanese friends, and then to his Peruvian friends, they're hugging and kissing, and, um, and um, always together. So it's, it's very different. Rules of conduct, facial expressions, nonverbal communication. There's so much more. Attitudes towards elders, concept of cleanliness, notions of adolescence, everything's different. And then there's un unconscious rules, completely before, below sea level, um, emotional load. There's so many other things that you can't explain. When I started doing cultural competency trainings, a lot of healthcare providers and teachers, because I would work with teachers, just tell me what to do with Asians, or tell me what not to do with Asians and Pacific Islanders. You know, and at first when I started, I'd be like, don't touch their head, don't point your foot. You know, things that I'm like, why am I saying these things? Because they're not really that true. Um, there's some meaning behind it, but I don't have that same understanding. Um, so there's certain things that are so unconscious, certain things that it's hard to explain, that you have to learn about them. And there is no recipe book. There's no don't do this, don't do that. I think basically it's about <coughs> learning more about people, trying to learn more of this, and know that culture is just not about food, dress, and music. 
So worldview, I love this slide too because um, my view is Western cultural orientation. Um, my husband's view is non-Western cultural orientation. So we always have cultural misunderstandings there every single day. So <laughs> mine is very about being an individual. It's all about me, you know, and, and it's about, you know, um, I'm going to do well, or you, I'm going to be top of the class, or, you know, I'm going to work towards myself. His is about everybody. You know, you're not thinking about the group. Why are you driving so fast? You have three other people following you. You know, it's all about working together. It's all about the group. What do we all want? Let's all talk to everybody. The nuclear family structure, it's about my family. It's about me, him, and our two kids. For him, it's about extended family structure. It's about, you know, our parents. It's about aunties and uncles. It's about friends. It's about their families. It's everybody. Grandma, grandpa, it's everybody is included in that. Relationship is hierarchical, um, and relationship is collateral. And so you can see hierarchical, the top versus going all the way down, and collateral. Um, also, cultural orientation for Western tends to be competition, being very competitive, which is non-Western interdependence. Western culture, mastery over nature, and non-Western culture, harmony with nature, being around, knowing that things are within, um, within uh, God's you know, uh, control. Um, it's within you know, the spiritual control. Um, future time orientation, present time orientation. I'm all about you know the future, the future, the future. We got a plan. We got a plan. He's about today, today. What are we going to do today? Religion is fragmented for Western cultural orientation versus non-Western cultural orientation about spirituality. Um, Western cultural orientation, scientific model, and non-Western cultural orientation, intuitive sense of knowing, just knowing, just having that feeling. Western cultural orientation, very verbal and non-Western cultural orientation is about being non-verbal. So a lot of times my, my husband will say, can't you tell what I'm thinking? I'm like, no, you gotta tell me, I don't understand, you have to tell me what to do. Or even in his own communication, he likes to tell stories and they go on and on and on. You know, and I'm just sitting there. At first, he used to get really offended because I'm like, get to the point. You know, and I'm like, you could have shortened that whole discussion from 10 minutes down to one minute. Get to the point. And so we used to get into fights about that because he goes, no, you're not getting all the things I'm talking about. From I'm saying a whole bunch of things. I just want the answer. I want it quick. Um, so now I'm, I've become very more sensitive to that, and I listen. And I really appreciate because I am learning. I'm learning all the things he's trying to say and what he's trying to convey. So some other social, cultural, economic, and political considerations, and I use these because this is something, when I was trying to learn more about Asians and Pacific Islanders, because I didn't know very much. I knew my experience. I knew what it was like to be fourth generation growing up in a rural area. I knew about racism, because I experienced it on a daily basis. I knew about um, what it's, I probably know, have more of an experience of, of the civil rights era. Um, going through KKK, things like that. I understand that. I didn't understand the immigrant experience or the refugee experience, so I needed to learn more about that personally. So some of the things I use to understand a community better is the diversity. How diverse is the population? Before I met my husband, I thought Latino, well, everyone speaks Spanish. We should all understand each other. I, I learned Spanish from, my teacher was from Mexico, um, and when my husband speaks Spanish, I don't understand him because he's got terminology, he's got all this stuff that is from Peru that I really don't understand. And the words are constantly changing. So even when his friends are coming from Lima, some of the words, he's like, what word's that? I don't know that. Um, but there's such a diversity, even ethnically, too. You think about Asians and Pacific Islands all lumped together, there's over 60 different ethnicities and we're all different. Language, just as I say, language is different. Um, Chinese, when I think, oh, do you speak Chinese? Well, which dialect? There's a hundred. You know, there's so many different dialects in, in every language. Gender, how males and females are perceived. Um, age, how you treat someone older versus younger. Generation, someone who has been here for eight generations is going to have a very different experience from someone who's been here for first generation. Background and history, what was their experience? I had one case of a woman who um, was giving birth at a hospital, at a teaching hospital. 
and she had been gang raped in a, in, um, a refugee camp. And um, she had a really bad experience and had severe trauma. She had gotten um, pregnant and her boyfriend left her. So she was by herself, single mom, 22, with a child, uh, already she had a child and she has no family here, they had been killed. Um, and then she has a second child coming. She's having her baby, she's by herself in the hospital, you know, pushing and it's just really going through an emotional experience. This teaching hospital brought in six men six of the interns to, you know, learn what was going on. They didn't know anything about her background. They surrounded the bed and they were taking notes and looking at her and watching her. And, you know, at a teaching hospital, she didn't speak English, and so they're doing things when you're having a baby, they're checking your cervix, you know, they're touching you, and you feel just so emotional and you're so vulnerable. She relived her trauma of being raped, and she didn't want to touch her baby. She just had a horrible experience. She was in severe depression, and no one knew what was going on because um, her she couldn't speak English and, and convey it, and she didn't want to. But just finding out a little bit of her background and history, talking to a patient navigator, talking to someone about, you know, here's a woman, can you talk to her a little bit about her experience? She's by herself, so I'm just worried about her. Um, immigrant or refugee, immigrant has come here um, by choice, but, you know, their experiences as an immigrant it's not always good in the trauma. Um, we've had friends who have um, come here to work and left their children um, behind, you know, because they're trying to make money, send money back. Um, but the experience of the child feeling like they've lost their parents and being raised by their grandparents. And then we've had families uh, who have sent for their children to come. And in the immigration experience, it's not been good. They've been really traumatized. They've been used by people. If they had to pay people to take care of the children coming over, the trauma that they felt. And the same for the refugee experience. To coming over as an African refugee, as a Southeast Asian refugee, the horrors or trauma you've gone through um, is really difficult. When I started working at another organization, I didn't know anything about the Southeast Asian experience. And I'm, you know, I'm like, ah, and running in and dancing and slamming the door. And I didn't realize every time I slammed the door, it would really scare them because they would think it was a gunshot or they would experience something. I was really insensitive to my coworkers. And I'm playing loud music and dancing and, you know, yelling. And, and for them, it was just, you know, they were going through so much that I needed to be more respectful. When they started telling me their stories and what was going on, one coworker who witnessed her husband being killed in front of her, seeing her children tortured, you know, being pregnant and trying to escape and, you know, escaping up a huge mountain to get into Thailand and being forced by the guards to go back. Um, just those experiences, I never knew about them. So just listening to people and hearing about what's happening to them. Um, rural versus urban. If you're from a rural area, you have a really different experience than growing up in an urban area. Growing up in a city, it will be totally different than a rural area. I still do work up in northern Northern California, meaning north of San Francisco, in um, Tuolumne or Eureka, you know, all of the areas up there. To see a doctor, you have to drive like 60 miles to get to them. Um, to go to school, you're gonna have to, I remember I grew up in Marysville and the kids from the foothills could never come to school in it, they got snowed in. So they would miss days of school. Because, you know, just the living in the mountains, you get snowed in and you couldn't come anywhere. So imagine if you needed a health care provider to try and get through that. Your environment, um, where you live, how safe it is. I always compare Santa Ana with um, Irvine. In Irvine, I have four grocery stores within a quarter mile of me. I have a park on every corner. Um, I can walk anywhere. My kids can walk anywhere. Um, in Santa Ana, they didn't really, you know, how many parks are open here in Santa Ana? Um, until Latino Health Access and Delhi started doing work on that and several other organizations started really looking at the community environment. Um, I know that early on I was working in South LA and they were, we worked with community health councils in South LA and people were blaming the community. Well, your communities have high diabetes because they don't eat fresh fruits, fruits and vegetables. And our partner, Community Health Council, says, show me how many grocery stores, how many mainstream grocery stores are here. We have liquor stores. How many you know, fresh fruits and vegetables can we get? No one wants to come into this community. Um, there's no one dedicating businesses down here. So your environment. Finally, I was working in Long Beach at the time um, in the early 90s when a lot of, uh, we had a really high rate of teen pregnancy among Southeast Asian girls. 
A lot of the policymakers would blame the families. Like, well, my understanding is Southeast Asian culture, they want their daughters pregnant, you know? And I'm like, where would you get that? They want their daughters to go to college and, and to have a job and have a career. And they said, no, 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 the culture is they're supposed to have nine children. So I was like, I don't understand it. And so what we had the youth do, we had the girls do is, what's happening? Why is there such a huge rate of, of pregnancy? What was happening is they were getting jumped into the gangs because no one was doing community and economic development in the areas. No one was building up after school programs. The girls were getting jumped into the gangs and they were having to ride the train, have sex with the boys. And they were getting pregnant through that. Um, they were also getting pregnant when they wanted to get out of the gang. Um, you would have a three minute head start run and people would shoot at you and chase you throughout Long Beach. Um, instead, if you got pregnant, you got respected out of the gang. Like, oh, Mary can't you know, come out anymore because she's pregnant with a kid. And so you saw more girls to get out of the gang for safety got pregnant. It was all environmental. It wasn't anything about their culture. Um, the other thing is social economic status. If you're low income, you really have a hard time with access to care no matter what um, versus higher income insured. And then also I think for the communities we work with, because they are low income, there's also perceived discrimination. They feel, and I see it too, they get discriminated against quite a bit. Oh, you're low income. Oh, you're on food stamps. Oh, this. Um, they really get, I think, targeted. Community issues. What are the community issues going on? We had a case of um, a Hmong woman. We were promoting breast cancer education. And we finally got her in to get screened. And it turned out that she had stage one breast cancer. And when her husband found out about it, he's like, well, she's going to die, so I'm going to leave her and find a new wife. So he left her because he didn't know who was going to take care of the kids. What happened, she was fine. She got treatment, she was fine. But it went through up and down the state that if you go get screened for breast cancer, your husband's going to leave you. And that became a big community issue. And we had to go in and, and do more education about breast cancer. Um, and finally, family and community support. What kind of community support do you have? What kind of family support do you have? Because that's key. So, um, and before we take a break, just some other issues to think about patients. These are just common things. There's so many things. There's thousands and thousands of things you can think about in working with communities. But here's some things that I really learned. Pain tolerance. For your communities that you're working with, what's the pain tolerance? Is it their culture not to complain? Um, I was on a call at um, St. Joseph's um, at the Cancer Center, and they had a patient on who's a Korean male, and um, he had had cancer. And he talked about, well, um, they said, what did you do when you had cancer and you needed treatment? Oh, I would leave work, and I would take the train, and I would go, and, you know, and then I would go get my treatment, and then I'd go back to work. Uh-huh. Sorry, Maria, just to interrupt yeah. that one. In the previous slide, I would also like to add religion. Oh, yes. That's important role to, exactly. to understand where they're from, either Buddhist and Muslims, from one yes. role. And also, it's in, in related to the issue to think about. Yeah. Let's say people like in Buddhism culture, they believe that because of the karma, yeah. they, are, they are determined they have because yeah. they did something bad in the past life yeah. and it result in this life. Yeah. That's why they deserve that one. They don't yeah. want to say yeah. So yeah. religion somehow it, It's huge. That. You're absolutely right. It's really key. Thank you for that. Um, so this man, this uh, this man, he just was never, he never complained. He didn't tell any of his co-workers he had had cancer and was getting treatment. He didn't say anything. When the doctor said, are you in pain? And they knew he was in pain. He would just never complain. He goes, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. And what he said was, I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to bother my son. I don't, and they were like, but you, you took the train yourself all the way for an hour to go get treatment. And then you went straight back to work. And what do you do at work? Oh, I work at a grocery store and I box and I do these things and I, I have to like put everything out. He never complained. Um, and he said he didn't want to bother anyone, but he also wanted to tolerate the pain. Scale for health. A lot of times you see these questionnaires. How healthy do you think you are? Are you very healthy, not healthy? You know, some of that is really hard to translate. Also, you have to ask, you know, for the community. Is it bad luck to say that I'm really, really healthy? Um, is it bad luck to say, you know, that I'm not healthy? You know, so you have to find out some of that background. Also, are there different terminology for common words? I learned a lot um, when I was asking people, do you feel depressed? 
Do you feel sad? You know, people didn't understand that. But they kept telling me, I'm thinking too much, I'm thinking too much. And I go, oh, okay. You know, I'm like, but are you sad? You know, and I found that thinking too much was depression. Uh -huh. Um, I just wanted to share a story. I was um, working in a doctor's office one time in rural North Carolina, and this um, lady was telling the doctor that she has depression. Depression. Mm -hmm. Depression is just getting so bad, and the doctor was trying to, like, doing this mental health yeah. interview, trying to get at her depression. Turns out she had a sinus infection. Oh, she's talking about the pressure. pressure. Yeah. And it took like a yeah, yeah, but that's that's so common. It's just the terminology or your understanding or how you want to explain it. Um, it. It is. It is trying to to figure things out. So a lot of it is a, nego a negotiation, but it's really about communication. And it's, and that's so great that the provider was sitting there with, just really trying to figure out what are you talking about. Let me let me try and really get to that. Um, are symptoms somatic? We will see a lot of community members come in. I've had stomach aches, I've had headaches. You know, I'm just tired, I'm tired. Um, and we have a therapist who like, they're depressed. You know, she'll tell me all those things will show depression. Stomach aches, um, how's it showing? And, and a lot of times when you're going into the doctor, you have 15 minutes. So how do you explain your symptoms? You can't just go in there, I'm depressed. I don't feel, you know, I'm feeling like this. Um, and respect for providers. We see a lot of this with patients. Just being respectful of providers, so really trying to please and give the right answer, not be bothersome. Um, I'll see this too, showing that respect. Um, other issues to think about in implementing, and this is now transitioning from patients to going to interviews and research. And then we're, we're going to do some more activities, so I'm sorry I'm just talking to you, but I'm trying to give you some background information. Um, silence doesn't always equal agreement or yes. I used to do questionnaires like, um, have you ever been screened for this? And people were like, I put yes. You know? <laughs> this means doesn't mean doesn't always mean yes. It could you know nodding your head could mean I'm I'm hearing you. I'm listening. Um, I don't understand you. you know? It doesn't always mean yes. A lot of times when I'm talking to people, I'm all uh, 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 uh. and what I'm just saying is uh, yeah 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 yeah. But I'm not saying yes. So, you know, or being silent, not just nodding your head, but just being silent and listening. That always doesn't mean yes either. Um, surveys and questionnaires, review, review, review. Make sure there's no double negatives because it doesn't translate. I've seen questions, don't you think that, you know, you should go get screening, but not this or this. So there'll be like compound sentences, there'll be double negatives. Um, and it's hard to say, do I answer yes or do I answer no? And when you translate those difficult questions to, if they're not correct in English or they're too long, translating them is really difficult. And don't just choose anyone to translate students or healthcare professionals. When I first started out in health um, education, I thought, oh, I'm going to get the doctor downstairs to translate this whole survey. Well, that doctor has so many degrees, and, and he was very proud of his Chinese, so he translated it in really good Chinese. But no one else understood it, none of the Chinese community. They're like, I have no idea what this says. Um, um, another case I had um, my husband review, thinking, oh, well, he speaks Spanish, and he reads Spanish. It's his first language. I'm going to have him review two things, because we had a job applicant. I needed someone to review their translation. He chose the first one, and he goes, her, her Spanish is really good. Her translation is good. I didn't tell him what it was for. I just said, which translation do you like better? And he goes, this one, this one's better. You know, it's grammatically correct. I then showed it to my friend who worked for the county. He goes, no, I would choose this. Who are you trying to reach? And I was like, I'm trying to reach low-income women who education is fifth grade or less. And he goes, no, 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 choose this one. Choose this one. Because my husband, when I told him, he just chose what he thought was the best Spanish that had correct grammar. And it was written by someone who had a college education in Spanish versus who are you really trying to reach? So finding the right translator is key. Um, you don't always have to back translate. We have so many times when we're working on a research project, we translate the questionnaire and we translate 100 questions. Then the researcher says, <coughs> we back translate it now into English so we can make sure it makes sense. Um, and what we found that that doesn't always, we don't always have to do that. We found a small group to review and discuss 
um, the translation and go through each question and practice it was better. And we found that doing regional differences, so if we do something in Korean, we ask Oakland people, uh, uh, Northern California people to review it as well as Southern California people because there's, all, there's, all, there's always regional differences too. And there's new terminology. I just had someone review a Korean book and she could read everything, but she's like, I don't know what this word, what is this word? What is this new word? They had someone from Korea translate it. And there's so many new words like uh, that come out from country of origin that she's like, I don't know what this word is. And folks who've been here for a while, even if they read Korean and Korean's their first language, they might not know what this word is. It seems like it's a new word. Um, and then some words don't exist in other languages. When we started in 1999 doing work in Pacific Island or Southeast Asian community, the words pap smear, it didn't, there was no word for it. A mammogram, when we said, and then we thought, well, let's just describe what a mammogram is. You know, we'll put mammogram and describe it. Um, a lot of the Southeast Asian communities we were working with, they thought it was the TB x-ray when you're coming in um, as a refugee, and if you have active TB, you get an x-ray. They, that's what they thought the mammogram was. So I was like, 90% of the women are getting mammograms? <laughs> you know, it was that, there wasn't that word and, and they didn't, um, we didn't explain it well. So MMR, HPV, HIV, all the acronyms, it's really hard to translate and folks don't know what that is. Um, I don't know, I didn't know what in all that was too, the MMR, and the, you know, all the things that, especially for, um, for the children, parents get really afraid we had one case of a woman where she brought her child in, and when you get your children's immunizations, you get a lot. So there's like a tray, there's four um, shots there, and the nurse was saying, it's an MMR, it's a DPT, it's da 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 da. When she heard DPT, she thought they were giving her child DDT. So she thought, they're giving my child, I'm taking my child and I'm leaving, because they thought they were giving her pesticide. You know, and she's trying to protect the child. So making sure for acronyms, those are explained. Um, so what I want to do now is I want you at your tables and to have a piece of paper. And I know it's just been a lot of talking, but these are common questions <coughs> that we always ask in healthcare, in research, <laughs> you know, all the time. And I want you to, at your tables as a group to think about what are better or more appropriate or culturally appropriate ways to ask it. When I ask these questions, people don't want to answer them a lot of times because they're like, why are you being so nosy? Um, we had a family of, um, who lived with two other families. Why do you want to know my household, you know, the number of people living in my household? Um, why do you want to know this? Are you going to tell someone, you know, about this? So what are ways that you would want to ask these questions? Think of some different ways. We also had, what's your household size, size of Pacific Islander, um, um, the Festival Association, PIFA, in San Diego. They did a survey and they asked, what's your household size? And they were saying, two stories. <laughs> and I was like, yeah! I would have interpreted it that too. So here are common questions we use every day. How would you, how would you want to change these? So take, take about 10 minutes to talk in your group and think about these questions. What are better ways to ask these common questions that we ask every day in healthcare or research? these questions been asked to you? Think about when you go to a healthcare provider, or when you go to school, or, or you go to anyways. Are these questions really common? Have they happened to you? Have you had to ask these? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How did, so in, in your discussions at your table, what did you think about these questions? Did any of them make you feel uncomfortable? Yes. yes. I heard, I heard Annette say, I'm not ever going to ask this question to an elder. <laughs> She's like, I can't do that. <laughs> so maybe let's go around the room and, and think about each of these questions. And what are ways that you've asked them so that there isn't any misunderstanding of what's your household size, two stories? You know, how would you make these more clear, more appropriate, uh, more culturally sensitive? So what's your household income? I get that asked all the time, and I'm kind of always like, what do you mean? I always put the wrong answer, so, because I'm like, I don't want to put, you know, what it really is. So, what's your household income? Did anyone, what were some of the table's responses? Well, what we discussed, oh, excuse me. No, what we discussed was if you were to tell um, the audience or the participants why you were asking that question, yeah. then maybe they would be, you know, more in tune to answer, yes. such as, 
the benefits you know, uh -huh. of you know certain ranges and uh -huh. what you know each of the households you know can benefit uh -huh. from, from those. That's questions. good. So Charlene had said that if you make a point of giving the background of why you're asking mm -hmm. that question, mm -hmm. that it's not just to ask it to be nosy, but maybe you're asking it to see what they could qualify for, which you could help them to qualify for. Maybe you're asking it for research purposes and it's very confidential. You know, you're not sharing it, but it just helps you to understand better. Um, sometimes when you ask it, you know, straight out, they, yeah. you can hear some hesitancy in my yeah. voice. So what I try to do is say, well, you know, we're talking about this assistance program. Um, so the highest income that you're allowed to have is this amount based on that number do you think you would qualify or something like that. That's a really so instead of them feeling like they have to give you an exact amount that they're yeah. not comfortable giving you, then they can, you know, give it, give it to you that way. That's, and that's, that's a good point because if you have ranges like you know thirty thousand to fifty thousand, you can say to qualify for this. If you're around this range, you'd be able to be qualified for that. Are is is any of this fit? You know, and that's that would be very sensitive. Yeah. And also, we would change. I uh, would not change. We just uh, just refresh it to what is your family income, uh -huh. and also we give you more explanation because yeah. it depends on what the research or interview yeah. about. You yeah. are looking for the individual income or the family, yeah. and family can be given a different definition, whether yeah. your son is there, your children under 21 yeah. can they do the earn income, or yeah. only just your husband and wife, yeah. something like that. So we need yeah. to give more explanation, what is your family income, or what the yeah. family means. Yeah. That's why surveys take so long, huh? Yeah. Because it's not just what your household income. Because we'll have families say, well, there's three families living with us. Do we count everybody? Or do we just count our family? Or do I just count, you know, who do I count? So it, is, it takes a long time. Is there any other? Uh -huh. Yeah, to get all these answers, when you need to have a really a conversation with the yes. family. And through the conversation, all the answers. Yeah. Have. And also, first of all, the confidentiality. Yes. Because after you talk about confidentiality, they are open to share. Yes, exactly, exactly. When we were doing a really long survey, what we started off with exactly was the confidentiality. This is just to help us learn where you'll we'll never be identified. It's not about individuals, but it helps us. And then we do, we just had a conversation and then the interviewer would just go back and answer the question and they would just be taking notes, but they wouldn't be sitting there checking off things. Because uh, you're right, it is a conversation. It's to make sure people feel comfortable. Uh-huh. Um, I would say also to, to set up some trust is to Tell them mm -hmm. what you're going to be doing with the information. Exactly. And it's going to be available for them. Exactly. To, because I have participated in many, um, you know, surveys, yeah. being, you know, being part of a person that's, you yeah. know, a survivor, and they, yeah. and they make questionnaires, and I'm always like, okay, so am I going to get to see yeah. this information? Exactly. What are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that would um, you know, help with a level of trust. Exactly. And that's, that's perfect because it is, what, what, what's this information going to be used for? Is it going to be used against me? Are you going to say this about my community? Are you, is someone going to come in and kick me out? You know, you're right. So what is it for? And then how it's going to be used and how, what kind of information is going to go back out into the community? We're going to find, you know, if someone knows, I want to ask about your household income because we want to tell the county that housing is a big issue for everybody and that so many people are having a hard time meeting basic needs. So your information won't be, no one's going to come and investigate you. We want the county to build more affordable housing. Finding out that background and then this will be released in all the newspapers. We'll give you the information back. We're writing a report. We'll give it back to you. Because people don't want to feel used. They're, they're giving you personal information and then they don't know what happens to it. And adding to all that, we also uh, were talking about who you're targeting. To. Uh -huh. The question will be depending on how you will end, uh, ask the question is depending to the audience that you're gonna exactly. that you're gonna be targeting. Mm -hmm. Who is the people? Uh -huh. How they're gonna take it in a different culture? Yes. How that goes. Yeah, exactly. So how you even who's your population that you're talking to? How you approach <coughs> it, how you're gonna say it, it really, really depends. You have to um, really target it, you know, appropriately. Another point is, um, what is the process before it's even published, just to make sure that they interpret the right information? Yes, exactly, because people could just, and a lot of times we just look at numbers. 
household income. You know, you're just looking at the numbers. You're not really processing it and analyzing it. What does this mean? A lot of times when we first did some surveys, we just got household income, and I'm like, okay, I know that, I know 00123 is that family. And I go, I know their income's lower, but they were counting, when they thought household income, they might have been counting auntie and uncle over here. They might have been counting grandma and grandpa here. So, you know, how to analyze that information and, and um, making sure you ask the question correctly and appropriately, but how to analyze who's involved in that analysis. Okay. So, what about household size? How did you ask that, or what are issues you found with that? Because that's a common question, too. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. okay. So, um, our our group was uh, thinking about asking how many people are living with you. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that's the way, and then we did in the range uh -huh. of like more than three people or two people. Yeah. And then this is the very sensitive questions when I did the way um, yeah. two months ago. I knocked the door yeah. um, at the ministry uh -huh. in Santa Ana, oh, yeah. and then there are twelve people in yeah. one apartment. Yeah. And then when you walk. The, I was standing outside the door, but yeah. eventually they invited me to go in, yeah. and then you see little four or five beds in yeah. the, in the little room. Yeah. They're going to look at you, yeah. say, should I tell you the truth or what? Yeah. So you have to explain the reason why it doesn't yeah. affect you. Because they might think that you are from the landlord, yeah. and they want to do a survey to kick yes. them out. Yes. Because in the contract, you sign only two or three people. Yeah. So we have to firmly keep telling them all yeah. the way along that that it doesn't affect you, we just yeah. want to gather information. Yeah. And even that, they will, even you see five beds, they just tell oh, only three people. Yeah. Yeah. So for sure they will not reveal it, but you yeah. cannot do anything about it. Whatever yeah. the answer they give to you, you have to accept it. Yeah. Even though they're going to look, keep looking at you, even yeah. though you, you've been with them for more than an hour, and yeah. then you look at their face, and then they're going to look back to you. Yeah, it is. It's really hard because people are afraid. And with this economy, we have three, four families living together, and they don't want to say that, you know, oh yeah, I have 12 people here, you know, don't look at the beds and things like that. So it is, it's really hard to get accurate. And we don't want to invade people's privacy too much and, and make them more afraid. So it is, it is very difficult. Yeah, I was going to say that they are afraid. Uh, when we were doing the census, we partnered with the oh, census, yeah. they did not want to disclose yeah. how many people are living uh, yeah. for, not only because they're afraid that they're going to be deported, yeah. they think, as soon as you say government, yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. That, they're pretty much shut down. Yeah. Uh, and also because they're afraid that if you call social service, yeah. if you're working with the county, yeah. and you're asking this question, that they might have their kids removed uh -huh. because you're putting them, you know, in a risk uh, environment, yeah. risk, risky yeah. environment. Or they might uh, accuse you of neglect yeah. or not being clean. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things. It's not just an easy question. So yeah. I think uh, I think our group was uh, concurred with everybody else is that you have to disclose why you're getting this yes. information. Yeah, it's disclosure of why you need mm -hmm. this information, what it's going to be used for, it's not going to be used against them, and it's the trust building because it is it is scary. You know, you could I hear stories all the time. You know, I was living with 16 people, they took my kids away because they said the house was dirty, you know. So, you hear that throughout the community. I think it really helps them with trust when you really tell them, this is my name and this is where I'm from. Because, like, if you just come and then you're like, oh, I'm from so-and-so, and they're just going to be like, oh my gosh, what, what information did I just give them? And they, it scares them. Yes. And if they know this is a number and they just, they just know that okay, this is really yeah. from a legit yeah. place. Yeah. And they, they're not scared to exactly. reveal who they are. Uh -huh. So it's, it's kind of important. Yeah. It's not just what you're using the information for, but yeah. who you are, too. Yeah, exactly. And I, that's so true because, so what she was saying is really telling them who you are, where you're from. So if the county went, so if Joe went in and said, hi, I'm from Public Health, I'm from County of Orange. <laughs> Can you tell me your household income, your household size? Oh, yeah. Do you think yeah, he's right. going to ever get that information? <laughs> <laughs> and he colors all dressed up in a suit and tie? Versus, you know, maybe someone at the American Cancer Society says, you know, I'm from the community organization and we're doing this and this and this. You know, who you are, where you're coming from, building that trust. But some places, it still will be, so no matter what, if you're from County of Orange, it's not <coughs> very hard. So I think that's why it's so important to partner 
with community organizations, with universities, with you know everybody, because it, it really does depend on who goes in to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about what's your place of birth? That, I get that all the time. I you know what you guys had a very good question on what's your place of birth and when did you come to the U.S. <clears throat> As indigenous communities, Native Hawaiian, Alaska Natives, and American Indians, yeah. you're the immigrant. Yeah. We're here before you, so that can be very offensive. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, working with and being from Native American communities, what if you're Native Hawaiian? What if you're Chamorro from Guam? When did you come to the U.S.? You know, it'd be like, or if you're American Indian, or if you're from an indigenous community, it'd be like, what do you mean? When did I, when did you come? When did I come to the U.S.? You came to us. <laughs> so, uh, so what she was saying is that's really offensive. Um, what's your place of birth? How do people respond to these? What's your place of birth, and when did you come to the U.S.? Where were you born? Where were you born? <laughs> We had an interesting, um, I was curious to hear how our uh, Latino would respond to that. Because she's born and raised here, uh -huh. and the assumption is that she's from someplace else. Yeah. So that can be also translated as very yeah. offensive. Yeah. If someone's born and raised. Yeah. Yeah. So it's how you, how you ask it, how you approach it, and giving that background of why you're asking it. So what happens if, you know, I used to get that all the time, well, where were you born? You have a city? <laughs> We're like, no, I mean really. <laughs> I'm like, uh, Northern California? You know, I think there's assumptions by the way people look. Oh, you must have been born in, you know, Mexico. Where? You know, I was born here. You know, or you must have been born in Japan. No, I was born here. So how do you even, how you approach it, how you ask it. Um, I've had it asked where someone didn't really believe I was born here. And they're like, no, 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 really, really, where are you born? And I'm like, no, I swear to God I was born here. <laughs> I was born in the city at Ryan Out Hospital. Um, Ask Obama, your other Yeah. Friend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have a birth certificate. I have the birth certificate. I'm talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good point. So for African immigrants, African refugees, think just assuming that they're African American, or we have so many incredible mixtures. Yeah. I have um, friends who are um, uh, black, but from Cuba or from um, Dominican Republic, you know, and um, you know, people will assume, well, you're African American. Are you from here? And they're like, no, I'm Dominican. You know. I'm you know, so there's so much diversity. Uh -huh. I'll tell you a funny story. Well, I, I, I'm Puerto Rican. Uh -huh. And so when I came here, and I, had lots, I, I was licensed in Puerto Rico as a nurse, and I came here to get my to work, and I, and I had to take the, the nursing test uh -huh. again. Even though I took it in Spanish, it was the exact same thing I yeah. took in English. And they said to me that I had to bring my passport for oh. the test. So I bring my American passport. Yeah. Besides that, I was born in New York. <laughs> and I put it out, and the lady says, well, where'd you get this passport? Oh. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, so it, you know, it's been, you know, so yeah. It's been so Yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that happening. <laughs> Things that you think, which place of birth, when you come to the U.S., you think, ah, you know, no questions, they're, they're fine, questions. But they can be offensive to people, or how you ask it, the attitude around it. But if people understand, why are you asking it? Um, you know. when, when did you come to the U.S., how about we put, um, in what year did you come here? And then they might say 91, 92, something mm -hmm. like that, even though they, maybe Native American, they said, I came here, uh, 1800 or something. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of different ways to ask it, but you know, it's how you ask it and, and giving that information on why. Yeah, I was just going to mention, again, it just comes down to the purpose of why you're asking. Yeah. Um, you know, I deal with uh, Medicare issues. Yeah. And so a lot of people ask, you know, do I qualify? Well, one of the things is, well, did you have, the way I'll say it's like, well, the requirements are, you have to have the work history. Oh, I don't have that. 
okay, well, so if they don't have that, that could mean a couple of things, yeah. right? And so then I, I go from that. And yeah. It comes with like, oh, you, well, I, I didn't work here because I, I, I came to the U.S. like when I was uh -huh. much older. It's like, oh, yeah. okay, when did you get here? Yeah. So it's having but a it's, conversation, it's, like you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. It's like multiple questions yeah. to get to the answer that you uh -huh. need. Yeah. That's why when you do an assessment, you know, and you're trying to see if someone's qualified for Medicare, how long does it take you to fill out the piece of paper? Oh my God. Quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if I'm doing it in Spanish. Yeah. Um, because again, not everything translates. Exactly. And so then I have to explain yeah. rather than just translate. Yeah. Does your does your coworkers and supervisors know how hard that is? I, I'm fortunate enough that yeah. my supervisor had my current. Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Here she knows. So she knows. knows. So she knows. That's good. Did you? Yeah, because like one of the questions they ask in the MSI application yeah. form, because um, I'm taking the MSI yeah. application too at the center, yeah. and then they ask, um, "Have you lived in Orange County for more than?" Uh, let's say, for example, five years or something yeah. like that. This could be a good question. You don't oh, have to that's ask exactly true. How long uh, have you lived in um, uh, uh, Los yeah. Angeles, whatever, yeah. LA County? Specifically ask those kind of things if you think you are qualified for that. that. That's a good way because how long have you lived in Orange County? They could say, well, I came first through New York, I did this, or I was born here, or, you know, I've been in Orange County three years, but, you know, that's a good conversation starter. And I think that's what everyone's saying is it's having a conversation, it's not just going boom, 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 boom. Uh, how did you ask, what's your, oh, how many sexual partners have you had? <laughs> <laughs> I never really want to ask that. <laughs> yeah. That's why this table said forget it. <laughs> Did anyone kind of think about that? How many sexual partners? <laughs> I, I was sharing that if I have to ask that question in, in a group, yeah. I will, again, explanation why we need it and all that, but give them a piece of paper yeah. and just write it in there. We will yeah. have the information, but no one will know. Because yeah. right it's a hard question to ask. Yeah. So you have to find the ways, like, yeah. yeah, how you will make the question. Uh, we'll probably not go there, because they're going to say, how many have you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or ask how many boyfriends or how many girlfriends, and then you can kind of have an idea. So it's not <laughs> Talking to her more, yeah, and more and about her situation, information, yeah. Yeah. the support that she needs, and then she yeah. comes with it. Yeah, so you really don't trust. That's a hard question. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, again, by, uh, why do you want to know these questions or the answers? Uh, usually for uh, HIV screenings, yeah. you want to know if they're in, in any kind of a, uh, they're involved in risky behavior. Yeah. Uh, so you, and it's for their benefit, they yeah. need to know so that you can better assess their risk. Uh -huh. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, can I see this? Uh, this? Okay. I, because I, I work in a radiology outpatient center and then I've done um, work at public workplaces, and usually we warm them up. So we <laughs> <laughs> warm them up. More blankets, chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Partners, and it just they're just yeah. warmed up. Mm -hmm. I call it dancing. Yeah. You kind of dance. Oh, you dance, so dancing with them, warming them up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. It's building that trust, warming them up, and getting them used to the question. Yeah. Um, I uh, I remember one one time I had to uh, translate for uh -huh. a um, sp Farsi speaking yeah. person who was uh, who came from Afghanistan, uh -huh. and uh, it was uh, they wanted to know it was a TV department they wanted uh -huh. to know if this person was exposing <coughs> other people yeah. so one of the oh, questions so was so this person is keep asking a question yeah. and I'm translating right off yeah. and one of the question was 
ask him. Now he's with all this clothing yeah. and all that, and very uh, you know elderly. Yeah. And he's uh, asking me to ask him uh, if he has sex with his wife. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm right. Um, I'm right there. First of all, I didn't remember the vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> situations if you are helping on something and you're interpreting for somebody and they're saying ask sexual partners ask contraceptives and it's so inappropriate for it, whether it's age or whether it's gender to ask those things but then the <coughs> provider saying just ask it just ask it yeah you, know, you got lucky he understood it so you don't have to say like for example I'm a black blood donor, so Red Cross, what they do, they make you do all that uh, fill up all uh, yeah. questionnaire every time you go, yeah. and you have to answer it, and the questions are very straight and very, like, how many partners do you have, yeah. or do you have a partner, but they do it in a computer, Yeah. so you're by yourself and you always do oh, it. Oh, so that's good. They, go, they so make you good. inside, and that's yeah. personal, and they walk out of the room and they say, you can answer, and the ones that you want to skip, you skip it. Yeah. But you know that you're there, and yeah. you know what it is for. Yeah. I have to say the truth because my blood's gonna go to somebody exactly. else. Yeah. So I and you realize that, and you got the information. Yeah. So they walk out of the room, and you just fill up. The, you just say yes or no. That's a question of. They yeah. make the question: Have you had more than one partner? Uh, do you have sex with the same? Uh, yeah. That's very, very, have you had money for yeah. sex and things like that, yeah. like strong questions that yeah. you will ask because you're by yourself yeah. and you want, you know what's the purpose of Yeah, but see that's perfect. You know the purpose. They're sensitive to these questions. Someone's not embarrassing you by asking them. You know to expect it every time and that everyone gets these questions. You get to do it privately. So, you said yes or no. Yeah, and you're saying yes or no. The only thing for elderly who might not speak English, it might be, it, as long as that the computer has it verbally in language. Right. To me. But that's really good, it's asking you, they need those, but you know why they need those questions or those answers. Mm -hmm. And I think they ask you, they ask you uh, if you need to translate it, and they put a consistent legal thing, yeah. so they put it in, in English, yeah. and then they put it, I think, on the language that you Oh, that's asking. good. So that way they... Um, Make sure that you understand. Right. That's good. Right there. Okay. I was going to say about um, what you had mentioned, brought up, it, it, to be culturally sensitive to the population you're serving, because there are some cultures that we had an experience where we had we were calling the doctor by the yeah. last name, or saying yeah. Doctor so and so, -so. And, the and there was this gentleman from Egypt, and yeah. he was went in, you know, yeah. filled out all the paperwork about an hour yeah. worth, and then he went in, and then when as soon as he saw it was a woman. He got up and oh. walked away, and he goes, "I don't talk to women." Yeah. And, uh, and then we found out by another doctor that in that culture, that it's it's below their, I don't know, they don't really see them or hold them in high regard. So the men would only relate to a, another man mm. and yeah. tell them about their personal. Yeah. Language. So finding the right gender, finding the right mm -hmm. age, mm -hmm. fit. Yeah. Okay, Joe. I was just going to tell you an experience. I had one of my first volunteer jobs in grad school. I had to uh, be a translator or interpreter, I'm sorry, for an OBGYN clinic. It was a free clinic. I'm not going to name the name, but it's in Los Angeles. <laughs> I know that yeah, place. As a young 20, young 22 year old, what behind the ears, I had to ask questions. Oh, like, yeah. Are you using contraceptives? What was the 
last time you had your <laughs> menstrual cycle? <laughs> as a Latino, asking yeah. another Latina um, yeah. who was a little older than her. Oh, so yeah. Very uncomfortable, the communication, and you yeah. can see it through both of our eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not very comfortable. Finding the right match, yeah, that, that's really very, very difficult. I just want to comment about what she said, and then saying that all men and Asians yeah. think that about what men and women that's another stereotype yeah. there. Maybe it was just that particular man yeah. feeling that way. Yeah. It's probably more that he wants to speak to a man, yeah. whatever he was there to speak to. Yeah. So we have to um, prevent ourselves from Generalizing yeah, again, so exactly, people. exactly. It could be personal preference, mm -hmm. but it, and it's it's hard because I I always do stereotypes of Asians all the time, and I forget. And so, see, my coworkers are laughing at me because, and then I I have to really catch myself because what I'm saying sometimes it can't be generalized, and it's it's really based on individuals. That's why mm -hmm. finding out everyone's and this is it's. Um, I've had providers say, you know, it's hard, I can't find out about every patient. But it, it, it makes it worth it to find out who you're working with and who you're serving. Mm -hmm. So that's why to find out about individual, because everyone is different. Yeah. I, I, you, and then Hank. Uh, in some situations, maybe it's appropriate to say, I am uncomfortable also, but this is very important, yeah. and that's why it's yeah, that, that's a really good point. I know when I had my baby, they were like, do you feel more comfortable with a female provider or is a male provider okay? And I was like, oh, thank you for asking. You know, <laughs> Would you like someone who speaks your language? And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I was also who I could understand. You know? um, but just asking, just asking, I think, is so important. Because I really appreciate that when someone will ask me what I want, it, it, it shows respect. Mm -hmm. Hey. And I think you just, you just said it, Marianne, in, in terms of interpreters, maybe back to that yeah. subject. Oh, by the way, Hank Fong is an expert in, <laughs> no, in uh, language access student, issues. A student, a student. <laughs> is that, you know, communication, again, the few extra minutes that we all take to understand the patient, the customer, yeah. Uh, to be able to set them at ease is important. So understanding the age range, gender, and finding the best possible match yeah. for an interpreter. Yeah. And, um, and if you can't find the same gender match, not that the patient or customer wants it, but I think you do your best to do yeah. that. To let them know ahead of time. Exactly, um, what to expect. You know, it's, it's we have a, a male interpreter in his 40s. He's trained. You know, and he's going to just be that to help us yeah. communicate. Right? Yes. And everything's confidential. I think yeah. setting the tone yeah. is very important to open up the best possible level of yeah. communication with yeah. the patient. <coughs> yeah. And the sensitivity exactly. to doing the best. Yeah. And I think when you do that, when you show you really care and you want to have the right match, when you want to make sure a person, individual, knows what to expect, when you're trying to find, um, Someone who they're going to feel comfortable with, that's cultural competency. That's making sure an individual feels comfortable no matter, you know, uh, if, how much you know about them. Lorraine? Um, one of the things that I try to do is, uh, because I, I work with people of all uh, genders and uh, cultures, and so when I first meet someone doing an assessment, I always put it out there that I let them know that, um, you know, I'm meeting them for the first time, and I may not know where they're coming from, but I'd like them to educate me. Since mm -hmm. they're the expert in their lives, I don't want to assume anything, yeah. so um, if I don't know something, then I'll ask them a question so that you can kind of level the playing field yeah. and let them know that, you know, just because I'm a professional doesn't mean I'm an expert, I'm going to tell yeah. you how to, you know. That, that's a great point, showing, you know, that you're not the expert in their lives, but they are, mm -hmm. and that just setting the whole thing. And that really helps because, if someone is going to be like, oh, you have a master's in social work, you 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 went to USC, you know everything. Although I think UCLA is better. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, it's a different culture. Yeah. <laughs> different culture. I'm a public school baby. So, um, but, you know, they could really put you higher and you're like, no, no, no. I'm just like you, but I want to educate me. So that really helps. Uh, 
That's a hard question. Can I tell you a secret? I never say the truth, and I start. I I always put a lot less, and I started to believe it. So I. <laughs> Folks know what, you know, when I, when I first got asked that question, I'm like, what's contraceptives? <laughs> you know? And then they're like, you know, the pill, condoms. Oh, I want you to say that. But how do you, like what you're saying, it brings in religion. I know a lot of my friends who are Catholic, they will always say no, but I know they are. I just wanted to make a comment, um, and I'm referring back to some of the research um, yeah. communications that you had shared earlier yeah. with us. Like in our culture, which would be the Pacific Islander culture, mm -hmm. um, once they have our trust, yeah. and, and it was alluded to in the conversation where the person said, oh yeah, but I stayed and I ate and yeah. all of that, so they spent four plus hours. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you, in our culture, if we were to do that, yeah. by the end of that time period, they would tell us how many sexual yeah. times. Yeah. 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 They would, yeah. They'd be so comfortable with us yeah. that it would be no big deal for them yeah. to answer any of those questions. Uh -huh. So trust is such a key. It is. Yeah. It is. So, and, it, and it's hard because you're trying to negotiate this. You're trying to build trust, and it takes time. Can't just walk in and walk out. But sometimes the system, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, it doesn't allow for that time. So to make culturally competent healthcare system, culturally competent systems of care, we need time. We need that understanding and that trust. I was just coming to. I keep thinking about the difference between being culturally competent and you know cultural relative or relativism, yeah. where it's just kind of it's all good, everything goes. And I was a social worker too, and I think it's important to to understand that from the beginning that there may be a tension between you know kind of the cultural norms of the people that you're trying to work with and your own, or the yeah. things that you find acceptable yeah. and the things that they find acceptable. Yeah. So. Um, if you assume that you have to kind of accept yeah. or agree with yeah. every cultural norm that you learn about, then that it sets up an obstacle from the beginning, yeah. as opposed to just understanding that tensions may arise and yeah. you may have your beliefs and they may and their beliefs may be different. You know, like with the gender, yeah. and you know, I grew up in a Muslim household, yeah. and gender that was one of my issues. Why? Yeah. Why are women? Why? You know, what's going on here? But I understand that. The, I have my ideas and my beliefs, and the, the people that I'm working with may have different beliefs. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a fine line because you really do want to be open enough yeah. to really be able to work with everyone yeah. and still understand that I don't have to adopt all yeah. of the beliefs. Or yeah. even if, if they reveal something about you know being in a domestic violence situation or just in a situation that you don't approve of that you you know think they, they shouldn't be in, and you really have to walk that line so that you hold your beliefs and you still try and serve them and work with them yeah. mm -hmm. as much as possible. Mm -hmm. If you don't know that in advance, yeah. then you can kind of find yourself in a, in a in quicksand. Yeah. yeah, that's an excellent, excellent point. And spoken by a true therapist, social worker. <laughs> because, and that's your training, and that's what I love about that, because you do have your, you have to be aware of your own personal beliefs, mm -hmm. and you do have to walk that fine line. And, and just like what you're saying, I, I have worked on cases where there was domestic violence, and you're just like, what are you, you know, my personal belief was like, what are you doing? But I can't do that, you know, because I can't be judgmental. I can't be judgmental. I don't know their whole situation. I don't know what's going on. So I have to ask the questions and say, if you anytime you want resources, here's some things. And, but you're right, it is knowing who you are, mm -hmm. but not putting your judgments or, or your values on others and understanding, you know, where they're coming from. So that's it's really great. That's why I like social workers. I love social workers. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that I agree with the lady there that 
it's key who you have as your staff asking these yeah. types of questions because they may be the best yeah. at what they do, but if they cannot connect to the community that yeah. they're serving and exude that mm -hmm. confidence, yeah. uh, they will never get yeah. those answers. Yeah, and you know, that's key. It's, it's the training, because <coughs> mm -hmm. this is scary, you yeah. know, to, to ask. I, I, like Harold, I work with Harold, and he's a case manager. I could never do his job. Because the things that he has to ask or the things that he has to have discussions with, it's really hard. And we don't have enough good training on that on, and on the background and what do you do. That's why it's, I think it's so important that as, as right here is an amazing resource that you keep talking to each other and keep supporting each other. So, okay, so, but I love that these are common questions and I, and I, I falsify information all the time. <laughs> We're going to take a, uh, Jackie saying, is that one? <laughs> a 10 minute break. So uh, the bathrooms are right out there, out into the other building. I wanted everyone to realize in this room, they're just by the conversations we're having, they're amazing, amazing experts. And so before we um, go on to our next uh, activity, I wanted you all to have a chance to stand up and say who you are. And, and something that you're an expert in that you could share with the group, because Jackie's going to be sharing the email list with all of us, but also just how we can help each other out. And that kind of helps us also to prepare for the next activity. So I'm going to have you go around and just be like, hi, you know, I'm Mary Ann Fu, and I work at Ocapica, and one of my expertise is, is working with some of the Asian and Pacific Islander communities, or at least I know who to ask for that information. So something quick. Um, I'm gonna have a start with Ariel. <laughs> what? Why I really wanted to do that is, oh my gosh, did you hear the amount of experience? Even though everybody, you all are lying. You're saying I'm not an expert. You know, yes, you are. In this room, you have so many resources, and the whole idea of coming together is is about working together. So now you're looking for someone who's good needs, you know, to work. With. You, you have like half the room. <laughs> you know, we, whenever we're working with the Latino communities, you have so many people, um, Muslim, um, Middle Eastern, we have so many groups. Uh, if you want to become a sex expert, you see Joe in the back. <laughs> you never, ever live that down. <laughs> um, but you have mental health, you have health care. It's all in this room. And so I know that we've come together for a training, but we're, we're training each other is the main thing. And so I think there's so many connections that could be made. So, and I also wanted us to go through that because now we're gonna do a quick um, breakout kind of uh, brainstorming again. And I'm gonna give you some different scenarios. And in your groups, I want you to be able to think, what are some key issues that you need to think about? Um, you don't have to answer all the questions. I just put some questions on the scenarios just to get you thinking. And we'll do that for about 10 minutes and then have another 10 minutes just to have a discussion. The only thing is I made eight, eight case scenarios. So I need a couple of tables, two, two tables to combine. That's it. So we're going to get started again because we're going to, it's almost lunch. So um, who, who helped promote HPV vaccine for Vietnamese girls? Who had who had the case promote HPV vaccine for Vietnamese girls? Oh, you did. Okay. So just uh, if there's one person who can just briefly just talk, just summarize the conversation or the issues that came up. You don't have to have answers, but just sort of what you what are issues that came up or things that you would want to do. <laughs> Um, we, we got into a big debate as to how like, we don't need to be talking about prevention and uh -huh. prevention trying to explain what we do, but then not only can we understand the community, it's associated with sex. Yes. So how do you yes. get past that barrier that is it's for the protection for when people feel like, well, it's not applicable to my child because yeah. she's not having to yes. <laughs> at a young age. And yeah. So try to get around um, that and more of community education. Yeah. And explaining and taking that stigma away. Yeah. That it's the, it's more for your health in the future. Uh -huh. um, and that it's to the benefit of the person taking the field. So yeah. when they're forty years old, yeah. Protected them, but 
think this is the time, this is the window of time to take yeah. it. And so get past this thing about yeah. sex and all of this. Yeah. And all that discussion, focusing on prevention. Yeah. I think that that's really great. So the, the scenario was um, Vietnamese women have the highest incidence rate of cervical cancer. Um, but the HPV vaccine, the, what is it, Papa? Yeah, yeah the, whatever that is. <laughs> that virus, you know, is, is um, if you eliminate that virus, isn't it like, and I'm so sorry, isn't it like 90% of cervical cancer can be prevented? I'm not an expert. But um, by promoting the vaccine, that could, you would just think, oh, let's just promote the vaccine, everyone get um, vaccinated. But just like what you're saying, it can be associated with sex, you know, it can be stigmatized. So I like how you thought about, let's, de let's destigmatize it. Let's talk about it being a part of our own health care and a part of prevention. It's something we want to think about, you know, late, you know, do it now to prevent it later on. And then the other issue is that um, it is covered by a lot of insurance yeah. companies, but a lot of people in the communities who don't have access to yeah. insurance like that. So it was trying to find other alternatives, like yeah. maybe partnering with the Asian Health Center, yeah. or some other community-based organization yeah. that provides for free. Because yeah. unless it's provided for free, it's yeah. like they're not going to that. Yeah. So that's, ex that's excellent too. So being aware of for the community, if there's a high uninsurance rate, if it's not covered, what community clinic, where can they go to get it covered at? Yeah. I think uh, maybe Vietnamese media is huge in Orange County too, and just maybe going on a radio show and talking about it and having a provider. Um, and talking about that is safe too, because not a lot of people know about it. So I think that's great. So thank you. Um, the next one's conduct mammography screening with Muslim women. Who had that? We did. Okay, Charlene. Um, okay, what, what we talked about and what we felt was really key for this was to partner with a Muslim agency mm -hmm. to understand all of the cultural um, aspects and whatnot, you know, of, of that culture and um, be sensitive to the fact that that culture, the, the women, um, very much respect their bodies, mm -hmm. and they would prefer or almost are um, very adamant about a woman-to-woman -woman gender basis, mm -hmm. woman-to-woman screening and whatnot. And also to uh, check with organizations such as Susan G. Komen to see what um, grants were awarded that could help mm -hmm. with the funding mm -hmm. for some of the uh, mammogram screening, and to promote in some way, maybe free screening, like, yeah. like they said, because that's a difficult thing for, you know, we felt for that culture, mm -hmm. you know, to, um, to go out and have the, the screening done. Yeah. And also take a look at the, the materials, the brochures and whatnot that are available through Coleman or some other organizations and see if we could have that translated into the different languages, you know, Farsi and, and, and so on. And, um, and then I'll find out and, and find out where their communities are and then work with, um, with the, the partnership of the Muslim agencies, you know, in those um, certain communities. But basically try to understand through the partnership um, um, how to approach and how to be, um, to get the trust from that community to go in and tell them that, you know, um, the key message would be uh, early detection mm -hmm. saves lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's key for any of the cultural competency mm -hmm. is to understand the culture before you go out there and try to promote anything because you have to be very, very sensitive. Yeah. Because in some ways, um, one certain thing may be accepted in one culture mm -hmm. and then in another culture it is not. And you know, I, I've, I've had that happen to me where, you know, something I've done in one, one culture situation has been okay and then find out I could not use that same approach somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, is there anything, have I missed anything else? Using their media. Oh, yes, the media. Their media. The, yeah. Exactly. Any language with multiple Muslim languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. So what they were saying is making sure to work, finding, uh, um, working with the Muslim community, working with community agencies, working um, with mosques, um, but also working with Susan G. Coleman, breast cancer experts, you know, and bringing them together. Is Coleman probably already doing this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, someone? <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, that why I, 
I have that is because I think it's either in o it's Ohio, Iowa. So one of not Michigan. <laughs> one of the states has the pink hijab uh, program, which the women are wearing the pink scarves, and uh, the Muslim community started the women started a really good breast cancer program somewhere in the Midwest. Um, so I thought that was so great. But it's really working in partnership, and I think you said it right. You're saying we're not the experts. We want to find out. We want to work with them in partnership, and we want to find money for the community, not saying we're going to start a program and we're going to go do it. We're going to work in partnership. So that's great. Um, improved diabetes control for elderly Latinos. Who had that? Oh, okay. Yes, we had that, um, that question for us, and uh, some of the issues that we needed to be aware of was that we have a lot of cultural issues, there's a, um, there's a lot of denial and distrust between the patient and the, uh, the doctor. The patient doesn't want to believe that they have it. The doctor, they don't have any trust in the doctor to actually take the recommendations. And if you don't accept your own disease, you're not going to be able to do, make changes. So there's that cultural uh, trust denial uh, uh, barrier that we have. Um, we have a problem with the environment. We have a problem with the lack of physical activity lack of diet, and we have um, multiple uh, diseases um, in addition that, that cause um, diabetes to uh, be uncontrolled. And then um, some of our barriers are language, education, uh, transportation issues, and most of uh, Latinos uh, probably won't have insurance. You know, the ones that are undocumented are, are already having these problems and they can't go to um, uh, doctor to get this taken care of, and diabetes is a very expensive yeah. thing to take care of. It's not, it's not just a pill. It's either insulin, which is expensive, um, and or pills, and the injections, and uh, the strips, and yeah. the glucose monitor, yeah. and sometimes those are not covered by insurance. So it's a rich man's disease. Um, and we've been looking at low-income uh, adults and seniors. So that's going to be uh, something that we. Uh, we really find a great area here with. And also, uh, what we want to do is we want to promote in our key message would be to go get screened for diabetes. Mm -hmm. And of course, with this being a low-income um, adult population, we would uh, suggest to send them to the free health clinics mm -hmm. where they actually do free testing. And they're all over the place, uh, free, free health fairs or clinics or wherever there's something available for them to get them for free. And that way, at least they could be aware and hopefully they could start um, doing something about it. And then um, we would use schools because um, diabetes is more of a family thing. There can't be one person that's got diabetes and they only have a, one diet. The whole family has to have a diet together. So it would be a school. Um, we could start at the schools giving out um, education to the entire family so they could reach both the kids and the older adults um, that are living in the house. And we would um, use uh, newspapers. Um, we would use churches a lot. A lot of Catholic uh, organizations could actually help us out in maybe partnering up with other health, uh, health fairs, health community um, uh, programs out there to get them together to work and actually maybe take them to the church and have the fairs there. And, um, and also use legislative um, offices, which, like I said, we're, we're always there to help promote whatever we do that you have to offer to the community. That's great. That's excellent. That actually you hit on so many different things. The idea of it's a family issue. It's expensive. It is really expensive. People get blamed all the time. Well, what you have diabetes, why don't you take care of yourself? But if you don't have access to exercising, to healthy foods, if if you the strips, the machine, everything, the medicine are so expensive. We have a lot of people who end up sharing medications. Um, is very common, but I think what ends up happening is when you go to the doctor, sometimes you get blamed, like, well, I told you to do this, I told you to do that. So for a lot of community members, they're like, I'm trying, I'm trying, but there's all these barriers. So I, I really thought it was great that you want to go into the schools, the churches, the media, so it's great you hit on everything. So that's excellent. So good job. Okay. Um, promote health care for homeless youth. Thank you. 
institution, uh, criminal activity, all those kinds of things. Some of the barriers that they have is that they are underage. They can have some access to clinics that are teen clinics that provide mental health and sexu sexual uh, health promoted uh, care, mm -hmm. but they're not, they can't even get physical or their organizations, regular organizations without parental. So they need uh, some kind of legal services to help them. Um, um, they, they also, um, these kids do go to school. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them are in schools. So there's a lot of services for schools. We have laws that protect them like the King Bento. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of provisions in school, public health and legal aid are the most important for them. And how do we reach them? Um, well, we thought that maybe a good way to reach them is to really train people in schools and schools mm -hmm. how to help them so we can have access, but also we get maybe peer yeah. community health uh, uh, workers to, to be able to meet them in the places where they're yeah. at and help them out there. And then we thought, because I've, I've watched the homeless uh, adult men, yeah. and they all seem they get cell phones. So yeah. they get cell phones. Yeah. You know these kids are going to have cell phones, yeah. and they can text messages. Yeah. Them. And so I think they're very creative. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, another thing is food coupons also. Yeah. So if they come in and get a, a physical or whatever, yeah. maybe they get some kind of a yeah, that's great. That's great. That um, I hadn't worked with homeless youth before, and we had a client, a, a participant, and I'm like, "Hey, you want a brand new backpack? Hey, you want all these bus passes? Hey, you know?" And she got beat up for all of that, and um, and I was just like, "You know, oh, I didn't even think about." And the, the next time she's like, "You know." Can I have a beat up backpack or an older one? You know, this was too new. Or I can't carry all these gift cards around. And so I think what you're saying is working through the schools, having the clinical services there, having um, working with the teachers to be able to identify. And you, you guys were right on on all of the issues that might come about uh, to be sensitive to. So I think that was great. And safety. Just, you just, yeah. And things that, Folks don't even realize. I just never realized about all the safety issues. And you're right about the cell phones. We text all the time, and and they get the the 30 day self, you know, the cards and everything. So, okay. Uh, promote and conduct cervical cancer screening with trans with transgender individuals. Who had that? Oh, you did. I, you know, I have to say, I think we have the toughest. I know. <laughs> I'm like, wow, we need this expert over there. <laughs> you know, what we, you know, the first and foremost um, is that we need to be educated and really understand yeah. how um, transgender is identified yeah. and how they're identifying themselves and um, be sensitive to that. And, um, you know, the most important thing we discussed is really going to that community because it isn't, there's not a lot of um, information and statistics and everything on this um, population. So we really have to go straight to the source to, and have one of our groups suggested having focus groups and yeah. um, going through some of the associations that exist. And another one of our um, members talked about on the university campuses yeah. now, there's groups and clubs. Yeah. and. Um, so we would have to go to those sources to really find out um, what the barriers would be um, and really have an understanding of some of the misconceptions and uh, that are involved. And then we would need to educate that population on um, why their health is important, um, that even though they've changed genders, they still have issues to deal with um, from their from being female and now being male, you know, they're still, um, they might have um, health issues, so to educate them that they matter, that they, um, people care about them, um, that we're interested in taking care of their health needs. And then, um, some of, the, you know, so they would use organizations and universities to get the word out, that's how we would reach them, and then using social media <laughs> and thinking of, different age groups and how to reach the different age groups for younger people. It might be social media, yeah. but for an older person, it would be something, you know, some other form. Yeah. Um, and then like, using peer advocates mm -hmm. to educate or promotors, yeah. like that type of program. Okay. And, um, and then we already talked about who we'd ask help from. So mm -hmm. I think we 
That's great. Everything, so that, that's it, really yeah, you did. You have a hard um, uh, example, but you know this is so important, and I think you hit it. You know, your group hit it right on the nose. Is really go and ask for help. Bring the community in and ask what they want. Mm -hmm. On the well, we were talking on what the resource we will use is once that we educate ourselves on the yeah. future. Ask them what can we provide for you. Yes. And what you guys really need. And who do we going to ask help yes. for? From them. Yes. So they're yeah. going to It's them. always, it's, it's never targeting. It's always working together. Yeah. So that's great. Thank you. Um, need to recruit a young Samoan female into mental health services. Who did that one? Was it the table in the back? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we talked about some of the issues that we're aware of, to be aware of is that just the fact that there, she's a high school student and she's a female, she lives with um, six other family members in a one bedroom um, apartment. So just um, the fact that this, she's a teenager going through the high school experience. She's also a female living with brothers and grandparents, she doesn't have privacy at home. Of the living conditions, so someone mentioned that there, you know, there might have, there might be like um, with, uh, abuse at home. You know, that's something that we can be aware of. Um, Low-income families, they don't have to, they don't have access to different resources. Um, just the, the mental health uh, access barrier, but that stigmatize, you know, mental health. Um, if we're thinking, we were talking to the parents that she is 16 years old, uh, we need the parents' consent or guardian consent. Uh, it's really difficult to uh, try to get the parents to understand uh, the importance of mental health and the resources provided for mental health. Uh, and also, somebody also mentioned um, sexual orientation of the student as well. Um, some of the, uh, how we reach the student is just more well, right to parents as she is um, underage, just trying to get to the parents, trying to warm up to them, also find other community partners that also work with the Samoan community just so that they can feel comfortable. To, to speak to um, others and maybe ask for help if that's um, something they need. Um, someone also mentioned a mentorship program we are to do. She is in high school, so um, working with the school to see if there's a um, mentorship program there. Or maybe um, the, the school psychologist or school counselor can help us with um, kind of giving us the opportunity to put our foot in the door to, to work with the family. Um, another person also said, just Provide supportive services of tangible services such as like, the bus passes or the the, um, the gas cards or the gift cards to provide groceries. I mean, you, it's she's showing signs of severe depression. There's um, outside external factors, so just providing the like, tangible support services. Um, what resources will we use and will we ask for? Is just the partners that we meet here in this room, or just um, you know googling. In Orange County, is there a similar community organization that can help us out? That's great. Um, one of the key issues, that's actually one of our cases. <laughs> and um, and what, um, one of the, uh, I guess, cha not challenges, but one of the things we had to do first, we had to um, talk to the grandfather. The grandfather was saying, my, child, my granddaughter's not crazy. We're not coming in. And we had to build rapport, build trust, and really go in there for a long time and talk to the grandparents. And for me, I would have just went straight to the girl, to the young woman, and talked to her. I would have just focused on her. That would have been the wrong way. And I wasn't even thinking about talking to the grandparents. So, But I think all the resources and talking to organizations, Google, Google is like a lifesaver. But just getting out there and talking to different people. Um, and talking to one of two Samoan clinicians in the area. Um, but even like Lorraine, who is Samoan and she's a clinician, it takes her a long time to build rapport and trust. She has to say, this is who I am. And so, But I think you're doing all the right steps of let's find information, let's work with people, let's try and offer resources, let's build trust. So that was good. So good job. Okay. Um, assist Korean adult male working in his own business and who has colorectal cancer. Who had that? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the issues we became aware of thanks to Joe who has other expertise <laughs> regarding the Korean culture that he 
this uh, male could be uh, working very hard, long hours, and that one of the major problems would be that he may not have health insurance. Yeah. And uh, what we would do would be to uh, take into account what would be his priority. Mm -hmm. The priority may be work rather than to go get yeah. treatment. And we had to take into account his cultural background, so we would look into what may be barriers such as uh, the insurance and the language. So we would look for community-based programs that would help us in researching what would be out there in the community who wanted to go for treatment yeah. or uh, follow-up for education. And uh, we would just uh, also find out that his support system would be yeah. his family, uh -huh. maybe his religion. Exactly. And uh, I think that's Yeah, that's, that's great. And it, it, this is actually a case that was presented at um, St. Joe's. And it, it's true, he was working all the time. He had to work all the time. He didn't have, it, but he was going to get his treatment. But I think for the Korean community, you're right, church is huge. Um, and working with the pastors, working with the churches to see how to support him. Um, he did, this case actually, he didn't tell anyone he had cancer. Um, and he was uninsured. So just being able to get those resources for him and, and um, helping this person working around with the resources that could support him. So that's really good. Okay, and the last one, promote prostate cancer screening for African American men, the middle one. Everyone's yes. pointing to the man. The <laughs> man. <laughs> 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 so, um, one of the, the, the main issues that we were talking about as a group, and this doesn't just apply to just African American, but it's kind of universal with a lot of men, is that the exam itself doesn't yeah. seem to be very popular with them. Yeah. Um, the actual <laughs> process of doing the rectal exam causes a lot of concerns about um, the masculine men, it raises concerns about their masculinity, whether sexual orientation. So because of that, they may not go and get screened for this. So instead of focusing on the actual screening when we're promoting this program for, for screening, is we thought about focusing on the role of being a guy, yeah. the positive roles of oh, being a male. Okay. Like what would happen if you were not here yeah. because you didn't go get screened? You know, you could be someone's father. You could yeah. be someone's brother, you could be someone's friend. So we want to highlight um, those positive roles that you don't have and then think the screen process with that. Yeah. So that's great. That's perfect. I like that. You changed it from from you're going to die so much to or get the screening and have the thing digital exams. Instead, you're like really promoting what are what's your role as a man? You know, who do you take care of? And you really put it positive, and I like that. You change the connotation because, yeah, when you think about cancer, a lot of people might equate it with something worse, or or they might equate it with death. But I think by changing it back to what's your role, so that was great. So I think you did so great on all of the examples, and I really appreciate it. So I think you should give her applause for yourself. Um, the last slides. I'm just going to tell you why I put the last slides in there. They're about Ocapica's experience with community-based participatory research and how I think CBPR is equated with culturally competent research. When you do CBPR, you become culturally competent. You're doing research in a culturally competent way. Mm -hmm. And once Ocapica started doing that, we were able to get quite a bit of resources and support and funding um, to really do our work. And I think that a lot of agencies are really recognizing that. A lot of uh, different uh, federal and county agencies are recognizing that. But it's all about working together in the community. And this just shows, you know, we did a lot of journal articles. We have a community IRB. We're a National Centers of Excellence. Um, and it was really what we just talked about, not just asking the community to translate, but to truly partner. And universities, what they can do, and, and universities gain so much, and the community gains so much. But it's, it's about working together and understanding each other. 
So we don't expect the universities or the hospitals to just say, we'll do it our way. This is, you know, this is our culture to be late every day, you know, or to, um, you know, to do this. We, we need to also understand each other's cultures. We know everyone's on deadlines and, and has to be get things done. So we have to respect each other's organizational cultures as well. Um, and these were just the meaningful aspects of doing community-based participatory research, that everything's from the community and that um, the community is very proud of, of what is accomplished. Um, and thank you. <laughs> I'm asking me a few minutes. Did you guys have any questions or comments for me? Thank you. Okay. And I think, oh, thank you. Um, I feel like, um, and I think that's, and then Jackie just has some reminders. Yeah, so I wanted everyone to thank Mary Ann once again for her great but I thought it was a really nice quote from the National Centers of um, Cultural Competence. So I thought it was a nice quote to remind us why we all came here. I don't think that we will all become culturally competent as a result of today's screening, but I think, as folks have mentioned throughout the day, that it is um, a journey, life is the journey of learning. And as we understand more um, and inspire compassion and respect for others, we also will receive that back in return. So I, think, I thought it was a nice quote to help end today. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. On the left side of your folders is a bright neon green evaluation form. If you can fill that out and drop that off in the back, that would be great. Um, this is not an endorsement, but I wanted to share information with you in the back. There's a bright pink neon <laughs> uh, form. Prop 29 is on the ballot in June. Um, and I don't think that most people are aware of it. What it is is um, a proposition that would add a dollar to tobacco tax on cigarettes, so if you don't smoke, it doesn't affect you. Um, but if you do, unfortunately, it does. But what it would do, if all the smokers in California stay smokers, would bring in over $600 million in cancer research alone in the state of California, which is more than NIH gives out to the entire country. So if you care about cancer and the people around you and tobacco pre prevention programs and cessation, that's also where monies will go. This is something you might want to pick up and share with others. There's also um, volunteer forms as an individual and endorsement forms for organizations in the back if you're interested. Also in the middle of your tables, um, my local Orange County Cancer Coalition has some free webinars that are upcoming that also may be really great. And one of the upcoming ones includes a cultural competency um, panel, if you will, um, on addressing breast health in most diverse communities in Orange County. So those are just some information. Um, a reminder that there is a funding opportunity with the ICTS, the Incubator Awards. Um, and really the goal of these workshops really is to move towards building research partnerships in health. So the networking, Marianne shared the wealth of resources in the room. What will also start coming with these workshops is the opportunity to receive technical assistance from folks like myself, who are masters of nothing, but Japanese of all trades, um, in evaluation. Um, resources to help write grant proposals, and then also the opportunity to partner up with faculty researchers, particularly from UCI and Cal State Fullerton. So as you, especially those of you who are attending the whole series, start coming with ideas about possible opportunities. And simply because someone's not in the room doesn't mean we don't know how to connect you to the right resources. And I was not joking, and I might you know, regret it later, about the ICTS Incubator Awards. This is why Shannon, myself, um, Arda, we're here to help build these relationships and to help provide technical support. I know that you all come from great agencies with lots of resources, but we're also happy to help build those relationships and to provide those resources as well. So please think about that and consider that. And we're also open to looking at other opportunities to support you. Um, lastly, if you are participating for the five series, there is a workshop stipend, so please fill out your W9 to get those back to me. Um, and to recognize and thank the Delhi Community Center again for the use of their wonderful space today. Um, and again, to thank Marianne for her time, and then the ICTS folks for helping to bring this workshop together.